Please join me in the prayer for elimination. May your word feed us in any time of loss, loneliness, or fear. May we partake of the bread of life to our eternal blessing. So fill us with your spirit that our lives may break into songs of praise. You teach us in all circumstances to do the Amen. A reading from the Psalter. Hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord with all my heart. In the company of those who do right in the congregation. The works of the Lord are magnificent. They are treasured by all who desire them. God's deeds are majestic and glorious. God's righteousness stands forever. God is famous for his wondrous works. The Lord is full of mercy and compassion. God gives food to those who honor him. God remembers his covenant forever. God proclaimed his powerful deeds to his people and gave them what had belonged to other nations. God's handiwork is honesty and justice. All God's rules are trustworthy. They are established always and forever. They are fulfilled with truth and right doing. God sent redemption for his people. God commanded that his covenant last forever. Holy and awesome is God's name. Fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. Sure knowledge is for all who keep God's laws. God's praise lasts forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Spirit, 
as you sing the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God at all times and for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, last Sunday, I had us playing some games together during the sermon. If you weren't here, know that you missed Simon Says and Follow the Leader. I couldn't come up with another game that worked for this week, but I do plan to make you participate in the sermon still, so get yourself ready, fair warning. Open your bulletin, if you would, please, and pull out that blue announcement insert. You'll need it. In the bottom right corner on one side, you'll see that we specifically left a couple inches of blank space. You found that spot? You're going to need that space along with a pencil from the view pocket in front of you, or a pen from your purse, or borrowing one from someone down the street. Go ahead, get yourself all ready. Now in that small space, on the left-hand side of the blank area, please write down the numbers 1, 2, and 3. You'll be filling them in later, but now you're ready for it so you can pay attention. We all know that intelligence doesn't necessarily equal wisdom. In fact, some of us can identify people who rank among the highest on the intelligence quotient scale, but rank among the lowest on what we would typically call wisdom. Maybe that's why Paul, in his letter to the church at Ephesus, feels the need not to tell his readers to be intelligent or to be smart, but to be wise. Paul invites us, through this letter, to live wisely. And in doing so, he links this time to the wisdom literature of the Hebrew Scriptures, especially the Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So as I look at it, it seems to me that we might consider this part of Paul's letter to an owner's man. Stay with me here for a second. I might choose to run my car, for example, however I wish, rather than in ways that are consistent with what its owner's manual recommends. For instance, I might choose to exercise my own freedom by refusing to put gas in the tank when it's empty, or regularly slamming on or even riding my brakes. I might, after all, think that I know what's best for my car. But of course, I don't naturally know what's best for it. The manufacturer of my car does. They know that if I don't put in enough gas, the car will stop running, even permanently perhaps. And the manufacturer also knows that if I don't take good care of the brakes, they will wear out, if not catastrophically fail on me. So, in a similar way, I might assume that I know what's best for me, and therefore choose to exercise my freedom by frittering away the opportunities I have in this life. I might choose to be foolish. I might choose to get drunk on wine. I might choose to say, stay silent when I could be speaking the scriptures or making music to God. But then, suggests the Apostle Paul, I would be acting unwisely. I'd be acting in ways that contradict what my Creator intended me for. I don't, after all, naturally know what's best for me. Only God knows that. Only God knows how I can live in ways that are consistent with both the way God created me and the purposes for which I was created. So we are advised in this small section of the letter to be careful how we live, not as unwise people but as wise, making the most of the time. And I am, you may or may not know, a big proponent of making the most of the time. I love my lists. I like multitasking. I appreciate productivity and the sense of accomplishment that always comes along with it. Now there are books and blogs, advice columns and articles
examples everywhere about time management and leadership skills, how to excel at making the most of your time at work, at home, at school, and at play. So we make lists and we avoid distractions. We delegate tasks and we tighten up our agendas. We balance efficiency with speed and we remember, we remember always to keep the Sabbath, right? But the instructions from this part of Paul's letter don't seem to follow any regular time management course at all. There's the brief list of things not to do, be foolish, get drunk on wine, but then the exhortations of what to do. Well, those are much less concrete, like be filled with the Spirit, sing and make melody to the Lord, give thanks at all times and for everything. Now, since this is all part of what Paul calls wise living, the suggestion is that thanksgiving for everything is part of what brings glory to our God. As the ones who are created in God's image, we reflect God then when we give thanks to God for everything. The Apostle, at least, seems to be suggesting that for us not to give thanks for everything is to not do what's best then for us. So, I suppose we could say that sounds pretty simple, right? We just have to be giving thanks at all times for everything. No big deal. The implication is that we should never be ungrateful or take any of God's gifts for granted. But friends, how does that actually fit into real life, into this day and age, into our everyday experiences? It might not actually be that simple at all. We could easily understand, I think, why the Apostle would invite us to thank God for the good things. Even if we don't always practice it, God's adopted sons and daughters at least know that we should thank God for all the good gifts. We know we ought to thank God for God's blessings in our lives that range from God's redemption of the whole world to the donuts waiting for us after worship today. But there are also plenty of things for which we might never consider thanking God, whether because we can't imagine that God has anything to do with them, or because it seems, in fact, offensive to be grateful for some things. Some football players, for instance, make a show of thanking God for a touchdown, and then plenty of others credit their own hard work and physical training. Some of us, for instance, pray before dinner together and recognize that no matter how hard we work to get that meal on the table, the glory ultimately belongs to God. And plenty of others are quick to wolf down whatever's placed in front of them since they haven't actually eaten anything in days. Can we thank God for everything at all times? Can we give thanks for the misery of incurable illness? Or the horror of children abused over the decades by those specifically they are taught to trust? Can we possibly be grateful for financial struggles we have? For unemployment? For broken relationships and dashed dreams? What would it mean? What would it mean to really give thanks at all times for everything? I think. I know we can only give thanks to God at all times for everything when we are wise enough to understand what the will of the Lord is, as verse 17 states. When we can believe that God, God as our Creator and Redeemer, intends good even in all that bad. When we believe all that because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the wisest, most godly person would struggle, I am certain, to give thanks to God for horrors like the abuse of a child, or the plight of refugees, for dementia, or climate change. Yet we can only even just begin to do so as we let the Spirit not only fill us, but also help us to honestly and compassionately wrestle with how to do just that. 
will also only be able to at least begin to give thanks for everything, even if just in the fits and starts, when we remember to do that together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I read an article from the June 2017 issue of something called Greater Good Magazine, entitled, Can Gratitude Make Our Society More Trusting? It was written by Elizabeth Hopper. She wrote, research suggests that Americans have become less trusting over the past few decades. That's a problem. How can we reverse the trend? A new study suggested one potential way, by increasing our feelings of gratitude. In the study that was published in the journal Personality and Individual Differences, researchers found that people who had consciously counted their blessings for just one week were more likely to trust others. This is how they did it. The researchers asked half of the participants in this group to complete a gratitude journal. Every day they listed three to five things for which they felt grateful. And the other half of the participants in the group, in their journal, simply wrote what they had done that day. Several days after completing these journals, the study participants all then played a short online trust game in the research lab. They were told that they would be exchanging money with another participant. Although in actuality the game was played with a computer and there was in fact no other participant. Each one was given a small amount of money and could choose to give some of this money to that other fictional participant. They were told that any money they gave away would be tripled. For instance, if a participant gave the online person one dollar, that other participant online would receive three dollars. And the second person could choose whether to send any of their windfall back to the first or not. Now the participants who were more trusting of others would presumably give more money to that second person. They would expect that they would get their money back and that both of the participants would profit. However, less trusting participants would presumably avoid any risk by keeping the original money they were given for themselves. The researchers found that compared with the participants who had written about their days, what they'd done, those who completed the gratitude journal, listing just three to five things they were thankful for that day, were indeed more trusting. The former group sent about half of their money on average to their online participant in the game, while the gratitude group sent 75% of their money. Participants in the gratitude group also reported following the test, feeling more grateful to their partner for sending any money back to them. Of course, I know there are plenty of research studies that tell us just how we could benefit all of us from acknowledging gratitude more often. We probably don't need to quote any of them at all. But I find that though we all agree it's a good thing to do, friends, it's a great practice to have, right? There are not actually that many of us who consciously do it. I mean, make a practice of it, write it down, acknowledge it regularly. So here we are back to that little space on your blue insert. And the numbers you wrote, one, two, three. Pretty simple. Here's your assignment. Before we gather at the table for communion today, before you leave this worship service, before you pass along the offering plate and try not to make eye contact with the person down the pew, before you help yourself to a donut, a cup of coffee, or juice, before all that, fill in your list with just three things for which you can thank God right now. Maybe one of them is simply that you got up and made it to church today. Or that their kids didn't spill, that your kids didn't spill their juice at breakfast. Or that the dog came in when you called her on the first time. Maybe another is that you can still drive here safely. 
Or if not, that you have someone who's graciously offered to pick you up and give you a ride. Maybe one of your things is actually the person down the pew from you, even if you don't recall their name just now. Just fill in your list, your list of three things for which you can give thanks. And friends, if you're really brave today, make one of them, one of those three, be something for which you would struggle to give thanks. And think about how God may be using that awful or hard or ugly thing for good, for God's will in your life today. What this practice is, friends, is a gratitude journal. It's as simple as that. So it's not just on this bulletin insert on this day, but a suggestion, in fact, that we all work a little harder at it consciously to give thanks to God at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So find a scrap of paper each day, or get yourself a special new notebook if that helps you, or yes, you may also do it on your phone, <laughs> but make an effort. I encourage you, make an effort to add this practice to your daily routine. I know you're busy, you might not be able to do it every day, me too, but let's try. Because maybe, just maybe, we'll start making the most of our time if we add this one little thing. And those days, you know the ones I'm talking about, those days that feel just downright evil, might sometimes be filled with the Spirit instead. Thanks be to God.